Israel's brutal offensive on Gaza continues and the death toll is soaring at a horrifying rate. What is the latest from this war? Elections to key states or provinces in India saw the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party make substantial gains. What does this mean for the national elections scheduled for next year? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. One point nine million people in Gaza have been displaced since Israel began its genocidal war, the UN Relief and Works Agency said on Monday. Israeli bombardment continued unabated over the weekend, with the death toll in Gaza since October seventh rising to close to sixteen thousand. Israeli raids are also continuing in the occupied West Bank. We go to Anna Rachar for more details. Anna, thank you so much for joining us. Another week beginning with a very brutal round of uh, Israeli attacks. The death toll is quite horrendous. So, can you maybe first take us through what have been the developments over the past few days, especially since Israel resumed its bombing? Well, when we look at uh, the past weekend, uh, we can talk about uh, the one of the deadliest periods since October seven, since uh, the bombardments on the Gaza Strip began. Uh, some of the approximations uh, on the death toll uh, are saying that uh, between 800 and uh, uh, 1,000 people have died, uh, have died until uh, throughout Saturday only. Uh, so we're talking about mass casualties and mass casualties which were caused by bombardments, again, of civilian infrastructure on residential blocks, uh, which have again erased whole families from, from the Gaza Strip. Now, uh, what we're seeing as well is that um, something that uh, that has been happening since the attacks resumed after the end of the of the one week pause uh, is that people are being told now uh, not only to to leave the, the north of the Gaza Strip, but also to evacuate the south. Um, so uh, formally, it is, uh, you know, uh, only very small areas have been designated as so-called safe areas. But again, reports that are coming in are saying that uh, the attacks are so ferocious uh, all over the Gaza Strip that there is essentially no safe, pl safe place for people to go. And again, uh, if they, uh, if there was an area which was not currently subjected to the bombardment and to the attacks, uh, uh, the problems uh, related to access to essential services like uh, uh, health, like uh, bakeries, so buying food, uh, would be uh, essentially non-existent. Uh, the um, the state is, is, uh, has been changed minimally since uh, some limited aid had been let in uh, during the uh, during the duration of the pause. Uh, but again, uh, international organizations, international programs have warned that uh, this has only been a drop in the ocean, and uh, that most people actually remain cut off from potable water. They remain cut off from uh, from access to any kind of food, uh, increasing the, of course, uh, increasing the possibility of famine is, uh, of famines spreading throughout the Gaza Strip uh, and impacting people even more. And in this context, would you also maybe talk a bit about the uh, certain uh, the health infrastructure specifically? Because once again, we hear about attacks on hospitals. So, what's taking place on that front? So today. Uh, most of the hospitals which are still operating in the Gaza Strip, which are not which are not many, uh, that has to be you know uh, kept in, uh, kept in mind. We are talking less than ten hospitals uh, of the of the thirty plus in the Gaza Strip still operational right now. Since this morning, they have been saying that uh, they're uh, they're receiving an influx of dead bodies uh, following the attacks of uh, of uh, of tonight and of uh, of this morning. Uh, so. Um, the, again, the the concern grows that uh, even more uh, even more hospitals will be forced to shut down as fuel runs out, as electricity is shut off, and as medical supplies are not uh, not in reach. Now, again, what what we have been seeing over the past weeks uh, is that um, is that it's not only about the access to you know to to health services, but also the living conditions that are uh, representing uh, a very high risk to people's health. Uh, we know, and again, the WHO has warned over and over again that in the conditions that we are seeing right now, uh, outbreaks of diseases are more are more likely. Uh, so uh, outbreaks of cholera, of lice, 
uh, of all kinds of diseases that uh, uh, are very strictly related to to how people live and to uh, what kind of uh, uh, infrastructure they can rely on. And in that context, one of the one of the news that uh, has come out uh, ca- come out over the weekend is a warning by the World Food Program, uh, which is. Uh, particularly worried about the access to food uh, for the people of Gaza since uh, they're saying that the price prices have skyrocketed so much that uh, um, people cannot afford the food that's uh, that's still available but uh, even with the high prices the the shelves remain uh, empty so people essentially do not have uh, anything to eat anymore that that kind of thing is not likely to change uh, unless the attacks stop permanently and then, of course, you know, uh, as we talk about the attacks on hospitals, which uh, which continue, uh, the proximity of hospitals continue to suffer uh, either um, either because of indirect shelling or sometimes because uh, healthy uh, uh, health workers and ambulances are stopped. First, uh, they are blocked from uh, from reaching people who are trapped under the struggle uh, uh, under the, the rubble of buildings. Um, we are also seeing. Uh, and hearing about attacks on bakeries, uh, on uh, on the places where people rely uh, on getting their food up, uh, food from. So essentially, uh, it's uh, it's an increase and a continuation of the attacks that we have seen since October the seventh. Right, Anna. Thank you so much for that update. We'll come back to you as further developments take place. The election results for five state or provincial governments in India were announced on Sunday and Monday. The ruling Bharatiya Janata Party won three states in the northern part of the country, while the opposition Indian National Congress won one in the southern part. While each state has its own dynamics, it's inevitable that these results were also seen as a reflection of the mood ahead of the crucial national elections in 2024. We go to Pragya Singh to analyze these results. Pragya, thank you so much for joining us. Interesting results on Sunday and Monday. We had five states going to the polls, of course, and the BJP, the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party, has won massively in uh, three of them, the opposition Indian National Congress winning in one. And of course, a lot of uh, speculation, a lot of discussion about what this means for 2024 when the general elections are going to be held. But maybe could you start us out by giving a quick update on uh, some of these major elections? Yeah, Prashant, like you said, the uh, election in four, uh, state assemb- for four state assemblies has uh, gone mostly in favor of the party that rules at the center, the Hindu Nationalist Bharati Janata Party. Now, the Congress Party, which has been in opposition since 2014, uh, has managed to wrest control of one uh, state from a regional party. Now, you know, this is significant because uh, the, the Congress party also succeeded in another state to wrest power from another regional party. But, you know, a, a, at the end of the day, the regional party swung over to the side of the BJP. So when it comes to predictions for 2024, it's really all up in the air. Uh, there are those who feel that the Congress party's losses in these assembly elections that they are the run-up and they are a clear indicator of what will happen next year. And there are those who, you know, feel exactly the opposite that, well, maybe now the opposition, which is actually a large grouping now, it's not just the Congress party, but the Congress along with a bunch of other regional parties, uh, you know, that they will re-strategize or perhaps strategize on how to go forward. Because now it one thing is very clear that, it's something uh, akin to a existential crisis for a lot of parties, not just the uh, Congress party, but a lot of parties will start thinking that, uh, hey, this is a real challenge before us. Right. In this context, of course, uh, looking at the three states in the northern part of the country, that is Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh, uh, there was uh, at least exit polls that pointed to a far more, a far less decisive result for the ruling BJP and in fact they had given one state uh, to the Congress that is Chhattisgarh and said that it would be maybe a close fight in the other two in two areas six degrees but it turns out that the winds have been quite uh, decisive. Absolutely decisive it seems almost as if it is scripted for the BJP for Prime Minister Narendra Modi who will who has uh, you know no doubt gone out to his party colleagues already to say uh, to declare this victory as you know as important as it is actually as significant as it is. But there's also another aspect to all these regions. Uh, Prashant, most of the elections were held in what we know as the Hindi belt where the Hindi language is the most uh, popular language, most spoken language. 
they're also resource rich states um you know i'll give you an example of chatisgarh which is just about 2 to 4% of india's landmass 2% of india's population but 16% of just coal deposits so and also one of the poorer states in india and that is true for most of these large and small uh, hindi belt states so the politics there often wears you know it's it's actually the responsibility of politics to you know to make make people head in whatever direction they wish right it seems that religion religion religious politics has had an influence that, that is something that the bjp swears by uh, and at times you saw the opposition the congress party which was in a head to head collision with the bjp in these states trying to you know toe that line this they've invited some criticism all you can say right now is that maybe they re-strategize maybe they think this didn't work it's very hard to say what parties do and how they decide and it's easy to sort of go in retrospect and say well you did this wrong or that uh, or that right but the point is that these are the poor parts of india these are also the resource rich parts and the irony of development here has been that the people are poor in places where most of india's mineral wealth lies and that actually is perhaps where uh, some of the criticism that uh, the congress party has been facing that they haven't presented a alternative model of development there has been a sort of sort of one upmanship on trying to soften the blow of economic policies but if the bjp is already doing that then what is the opposition offering perhaps be a big question right uh, pragya interesting i guess also for 2024 all parties now drawing their own strategies and conclusions uh, from this election but this area is also very important for 2024 because the sheer number of seats right i was making a quick calculation about 88 uh, seats went to the polls this time that's i think about 15 to 16% of the total uh seats in the country that head for the polls but these things have a sort of momentum of their own and uh you know so that's where the risks for the opposition lie right thank you so much pragya for the analysis and that's all we have time for in today's episode we'll be back tomorrow with another episode in the meanwhile do visit our website peoplesdispatch.org and follow us on all the social media platforms Music